In this video, we're going to investigate uh, coin flips again, and this time we're going to see how the search for a match scales. I'm going to use the random library for my coin flips, and I'm going to create a sequence of uh, a given length that is what I'm going to search for in this function. So this is simply saying how long do I want the sequence to be, and then I'm going to create a, a set of flipped values. And the values are either going to be a 1 or a 2, correlating to like a heads or tails outcome for my coin flip. And so I can call that function to see what that looks like, just to get some idea of the outcome of, say, 5 coin flips. I'd get maybe a heads, 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 tail. OK, so that's our first function, this setting us up for what we're going to match with. We're going to need a second function, which is I'll call find match. Here, uh, if you've watched a previous video on how I find a match with some random sequence, this is the same code, but wrapped up in a function for, for easier use uh, elsewhere. Here, I'm going to pass in my sequence of interest. And then I'm going to basically search inside this infinite loop right here for a match until I find one. And once I've found a match, I'm going to say, how many coin flips did it take to find a match with that input sequence? So inside the, the while loop here, we're basically doing a coin flip. And then we're seeing whether that sequence of coin flips matches the sequence that we put in as the thing that we're looking for. Initially, if uh, we don't find a match, we'll consider the outcome false. And then we're gonna just going to incrementally search through those two lists until we either uh, find a, uh, an element that does not match in both lists, in which case we'll break out of the for loop. Or if we reach the end of the for loop and we uh, did find a match, then we'll say we found a match, so we're breaking out of this while loop. All right, so again, at the end, we'll return two values, the number of coin flips, and how long it took to find that. All right, let's insert uh, a new cell here, and we'll call this function just to see how it works. So I happen to already have uh, a sequence of interest. And then sequence of interest. And then I'm going to call the function here find match. So I need to pass in my sequence of interest. So I need to run that cell first. And I can get back two things, the time it took in seconds to execute a search for my sequence of interest, which let's just put that here. All right, we'll run that again. So now my sequence of interest of five digits is uh, heads, heads, tail, heads, heads. And it took 0 0.0004 seconds to find a match. And there were 75 coin flips to get to a match for this sequence. All right, so now I'm going to uh, investigate scaling of this experiment. I'm going to increase the size of the sequence, and I want to measure how long it takes as a function of the search size and how many coin flips I do during that search. I'm going to set up uh, a thousand searches for each sequence length. So I'm going to have uh, a thousand sequences of length three, a thousand sequences of length four, a thousand sequences of length five. Those are the things I'm trying to match. And for each of those sequences, I'm going to see how long does it take to find a, a given sequence of length three? How many coin flips does it get to get this length uh, three list? So like, it's like a tail, tail, tail. And so I'm going to do that a thousand times. Then I'm going to repeat the same measurement for a thousand times of a uh, sequence of length four. And I'm gonna, so I basically have three parameters, the number of uh, things that I'm matching for in each, um, in each length. And then I'm going to investigate from sequence lengths 3 through 10. So that's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 10. So 
this is basically the, the investigation that I want to set up. How many coin flips does it take to match various sequence lengths? Okay, so now that we have sort of like the, the experimental design in mind, now we have to code that up in Python. To do that, we're going to have two nested for loops. So the outer for loop is how many, uh, what, what the length of the sequence is. That's going to range from 3 to 10. And then we have to also have an index for each of these experiments here. So this is for a sequence of length 3, uh, 1, 2, 1. How many coin flips? So that's this inner inner loop here. So let's run that. Let's make sure I ran this. So this cell is executing, and basically we're going to create a sequence of interest. That 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 list is then going to be uh, searched through uh, this function that we wrote called the find match. And that will return two values, how long it took to find a match, and the number of coin flips associated with that. And then, we will then we'll store the outcome from that specific uh, measurement into a dictionary. And then that dictionary goes into a list of dictionaries. Now we've got this list of dictionaries for each of the nested for loops. So we're going to have the, the, the sequence size is changing, and we're doing it uh, for many, many experiments. Okay, so that cell took about 46 seconds to execute. Now let's visualize what that looks like. I'm going to convert the list of dictionaries into a pandas data frame. And then that looks like uh, the experimental outcome. So basically we have, this is a running index of which experiment we're in. And here we see for some random sequence of length 3, it took 75 flips to find a match. And that execution ran in 0 0.0005 seconds. Then we did another experiment to find another random sequence of length 3. And this time it only took 30 coin flips to find a match. And we just kept doing this for a really long time for a lot of experiments. Let's see how big that is. I'm going to measure the shape of that. So we did 7,000 different permutations of the sequence length from 3 to 10, and we did a thousand of each of those sequence lengths. So a thousand of 3, a thousand of 4, a thousand of 5, and the total size, the number of rows in that is 7,000 in our data frame. Now we have something that we can plot. So let's look at matplotlib and look at a scatter plot for the sequence length versus, so the sequence length here, this is our number of coin flips was three, number of coin flips was four, number of coin flips was five. And we want to ask, how long did it take to find a match? That's the y-axis here. So we can see a pretty short time, and it's not perfectly monotonically increasing, but overall we can see uh, the number of, uh, the amount of time it takes to find a match is increasing. The reason there's a whole bunch of points here is because we did this experiment a thousand times, and we did this experiment a thousand times, and we did this experiment a thousand times. But what's interesting is that there's some variation to this. So sometimes it took less time to find a match, and sometimes it took more time to find a match. So that's why there's multiple values here. I would argue that the scatter plot isn't that great because it kind of obfuscates the fact that there are a thousand different data points here. So we'll come back to that in a moment. The other plot that we can look at is sequence length versus number of flips. So again, we had three random coin flips as our, our investigation, and then we wanted to know how many coin flips did it take to find a match. For three, we did it pretty quickly. Remember, it was about 75 or so. As you increase the sequence length, the number of flips that it took to find a match, again, increases. And as with our time, there's some variation. So sometimes we found a match very quickly, and sometimes it took longer to find a match. But again, the scatter plot, although it does show the data, it's not very uh, clear about how many, uh, what's the average, right? Like, where is the average down here? Like, these are clearly outliers, but what's the, the average number of flips that it would take? So one way, if we don't want to stick with a visual, is to do a, a describe. And we can do that for each of the sequence lengths. 
So here we can see the mean time in seconds uh, and then the number of flips as a, another set of data. So this is a tabular form of sort of the statistical uh, variation of these two plots here. So it's pretty handy, but there's a lot of numbers here and it's, it's kind of hard to read. So let's see if we can do slightly better than the table be uh, representing our, our data. So error, error uh, bars are really the, the where we're going here. And we'll use Seaborn because it's pretty easy to use. Um, we're just going to pass it in uh, the same columns of sequence length and number of flips. And our, our first thing that we'll try is a strip plot. So this is slightly different than the, uh, the scatter plot. So it adds a little bit of width to each of the categories here, basically. So these are treated as categories. Um, but it's still not that much better because it's still not clear where the highest density is. That leads us to try a, a box plot. The box plot is probably uh, a very safe bet in this case. So we want to have an idea of where the, the average is for each of these curves. Down here, there's a really small number of samples and it's a very tight distribution. So you can't actually see much. Only when we get out to the longer sequences does this start to make sense of like, there's an average value and where the mean is and then the outliers. So this is all based on the, the box plots here. They're making some uh, automated intuition about what the, the the edges of these boxes and error bars mean. So these are based on quartiles, which you can read on Wikipedia. So this is, this is, I would argue, a better presentation of the data. It contains more information, but not so, so well for these small uh, data sizes down here. Okay, the last plot, which doesn't uh, render very well and I'll show is a violin plot. Because our sample sizes were very small, uh, the violin plot kernel density function doesn't work out very well, but uh, often for significant amount of data, the kernel density plot is the right choice. So I'd say in this, in this data, because it was small, the box plot ends up being a, a good use here.